So I woke up to that headline this last Monday morning. Preston Pastors Falls to Historic Low. Uh, I get a daily email from called Life We Research. It just covers all things church-related. And the article went on to, to explain, of course, uh, what this is all about. It stated that, uh, I believe the survey must have been taken, uh, probably based on the year 2022, stated that 34% of Americans, so one out of three Americans, when ranking uh, the trust factor of different professions, 34% of Americans ranked pastors as high or very high. So in other words, two-thirds of Americans don't trust pastors. In case you're interested, I, I thought it was uh, pretty fascinating, just a few other statistics. The highest rated uh, a profession in, among Americans was at 70, 79% approval rating, a clergy trail nurses. Now, I don't know what that is. I get the clergy part. I get the nurses part. I don't get maybe just uh, Christian-based medical providers in remote parts of the world, I guess, is what I can make sense of that. So 79%, they were the number one ranked out of the 18 that were part of the survey. And I'm not going to ask you to, to guess what the lowest ranked was, because then you're going to reveal who you trust the least in life, uh, but it is telemarketers, and it's 6%, and if they could only find out who those 6% are, then they'd have a lot of success. But here's the thing. I don't think this is just about pastors. It would appear as though the public perception of Christians in general is trending downward. In fact, I read another article yesterday to that very to that very point. Um, I didn't include any of that here in the message. But the, the, the point of this here isn't to try to make us feel sorry for ourselves. The, the point of this here isn't to, hey, let's all get offended. Let's be mad. Let's go out there and defend ourselves. Let's make sure we find the critics and tell them that they're absolutely wrong. That's not helpful, I don't think. That would probably only perpetuate the situation. I have an idea, not a, an original idea, but, but I think it's a better idea. Why don't we first try to seek to understand why this is the case? In the case of clergy, as you can imagine, the, it, it, it's cited as the primary, well, let me just say this, it, this the decline has, has happened uh, largely in the last 20 years. So in, in the year 2001, the trust factor, so to speak, of pastors was at 64%. And so now today, roughly 20 years later, it's at 34%. Uh, coincidentally, judge for yourself, I became a pastor about 20 years ago. So, um, <laughs> but they, the article did go on to say that it, it attributed the, the decline primarily to high-profile scandals in the church among the clergy, as you can imagine. There's, you know, the clergy abuse scandals. And not only that, but high-profile um, moral failure among clergy that has, you know, made the headlines. When it comes to Christians in general, the, 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 the public perception, it, would, it, it seems pretty obvious that it really just comes down to a matter of Christians behaving badly. And, and I would add this, unapologetically so. Because we're all sinners, we all do things that are, uh, use the same word, bad. You know, sins are not good. We all, we all do things, and, um, but, but we're talking, I, I guess I'm referring to more just that the unapologetic, uh, sometimes seemingly heartless actions that even sometimes Christians engage in, sadly. So, for example, just getting into heated religious arguments, thinking you can argue someone into faith, or, or angrily quoting scripture, or angrily misquoting scripture, or, or using the Bible as a club. But sometimes, as Christians, that happens. Now, the reality is that the Bible is God's word. We, we, we believe it to be. We respect it as such. And we realize that it's not our place to change it, but at the same time, that doesn't give us the right to not speak the truth in love when we get into those conversations. Another area where um, it would appear as though Christians have behaved 
maybe not as well as we could at times, is in the area of politics, uh, shady politics, political maneuvering. Um, you know, as Christians, we all, we go to the polls and we vote our consciences, and we should. And sometimes as Christians, we band together and, and, and fight a certain cause. But that doesn't give us a right to set aside our integrity in doing so. Perhaps you heard that there is a one, maybe two Super Bowl commercials next Sunday that have to do with Jesus, right? And, what I, and I read up on that a little bit. One of you sent me an article. And the critics, apparently, in this one article that I read, the critics are saying that these commercials really aren't at all about Jesus. What they're about is, is this voting block trying to pull people into their side really with, with a, a different political agenda in mind. And that assumption wouldn't, and, and it's sad, right? Because people, it, it would seem, are legitimately, genuinely, lovingly wanting to share Jesus next Sunday when there's such a huge, huge audience. But the sad part, that's the saddest part, um, but then those, the critics wouldn't be making those assumptions if there weren't at least a bit of a track record there. You know, just some ugly politics that have happened even among followers of Christ. You know, God is, God is clear in his word, right, about what's right and wrong. And again, we don't have, it's, it's not our place to change that. But that doesn't give us the right to not love our neighbors as ourselves, including those who don't walk in step with God's, God's word. Another just thought with regard to this whole spirit, this whole uh, public perception of Christians that I know has been written on plenty is just hypocrisy, or you might say selective morality, condemning some sins while at the same time ignoring or even, again, unapologetically engaging in other sins. Now again, the, the point here isn't to, to get us mad or, or make us feel offended. Um, and, and I also, at the same time, I'm not saying it's always fair or justified, because as with most things in life, I think it's probably more a few bad apples, or at least the, the minority. My point, though, is let's, under, let's seek to understand, let's understand reality. And, and let's understand our audience. Right? So that we that, that we can, with that knowledge then, it helps us better interact with the people around us, with the world around us. And again, you know, just let, let's just, with, with that in mind, um, seeking to understand, then let's ask ourselves, what, what can we do? What can each and every one of us do as Christians, whether individually or collectively? What can we do to, to give the most positive impression of what it truly means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and what this comes down to really is identity, isn't it? Understanding who we are and then being who we are in life. You know, if, if someone came up to you and said, who are you? What, what, what are you? Tell me about yourself. I've never met you before. Hi, Ed. My name's Steve. Good to meet you. Tell me about Ed. Tell me about Ed Hogan. How, what would you say? How would you finish that sentence, I am a what? I think for a lot of us, we, we would identify, we identify, our identity is kind of wrapped up in our career, what we do. Right? I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher, I'm an artist, a sculptor, I'm an engineer, I'm a sales rep. Right? I mean, we, we, our identity is often wrapped up in what we do. Or our identity is wrapped up in, 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 in something related to family. I'm married, I'm divorced, I'm single, I'm a widow. I'm a parent, I'm a child. Or sometimes our, our identity is wrapped up in, in season of life. I'm a student. I'm retired. I'm middle-aged. And, and none of these things are wrong. These are true statements, right? I am a pastor. I am married. I am pushing back on the label middle-aged, but I'm still middle-aged. <laughs> um, and yet I wonder sometimes if while those are true statements, I wonder sometimes if we think in the wrong order when it comes to who our identity, who we truly are. Again, Peter, as we heard earlier in the lesson from 1 Peter chapter 2, he reminds us of our identity. 
And I just want to begin with, in verse, uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he just begins with two, pow- two words, you are, he says. Those are two powerful words, right? They're probably more powerful for what comes after, <laughs> but these are. They, in, in God, through Peter, he's saying, you, I'm talking to you, each and every one of you, directly to you, you are. Everything that comes after these two words applies to you. And as we know, a lot can be said after these two words, a lot is said in life after these two words, you are. And it's not always good. It's not always healthy. You know, as individuals, sometimes we look in the mirror, whether literally or in our minds, and we say, you are a failure. You are insufficient. You're not good enough. Or or sometimes others, you know, keeping it in the context of of public perception, uh, others might say to you as a Christian, you are a hypocrite. You are intolerant. You are a fool for believing that old book. And you know the devil's uh, right there, jumping on the bandwagon, in fact, taking it to the next level. You're a disaster, the devil says. You are, you're, you're a horrible person. You are not worthy of God. You are not worthy of his grace. You are not worthy of forgiveness. And, and, there, and the difficult thing is that sometimes, there's some truth in there. I am a sinful, imperfect human being. That is a, that, that, that's a true statement. The, it's, it's true that, that, you know, I have successes and failures. I have strengths and weaknesses. I, I am not worthy of God's grace. I don't deserve to be called a, a dearly loved, forgiven child of God. And yet, the key, and, and understand, yeah, at times we need to deal with reality. We need to be honest with ourselves and admit our wrongdoings. We need to let others, you know, iron sharpen iron, uh, Loving, well-meaning, constructive criticism. I'm not saying that that's not okay. My point is, we also, when when those statements are in conflict with what God says about who you are, with the identity that, that he very clearly in his word lays out and wants you to know and embrace each and every day. There's a lot of negative self-talk, right? And a lot of negative feedback coming at us. And again, time and a place for everything. But when it contradicts with who God says you are, that's when we get into trouble. So at this point, we're going to watch just a, a two-minute video. I just thought it was a really, just a cool, um, the, the, the gentleman in the video, you're going to hear over and over and over and over and over and over again, he reminds us of who we are. And, and we should never forget who we are by God's grace through Christ. Let's take a look. Because of Jesus, I am a accepted, adopted, approved, and alive. I am an ambassador for Christ. I am B, beloved, blessed, born again, and a bond servant of Jesus. I am C, chosen of God, a child of God, citizen of heaven, and crucified with Christ. I am D, delivered from darkness, dead to sin, and a disciple of Jesus. I am elect, I am forgiven and free, I am God's workmanship, I am an heir through God and hidden in Christ. I am the image of God and forever in Christ. J, I am justified by faith. K, I am kept for Jesus and known by God. L, I am the light of the world and loved by the Father. M, I am more than a conqueror and a minister of reconciliation. N, I am a new creation, I am not ashamed, I am not forsaken, I am not condemned and I am never alone. I am an oak of righteousness, once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm a priest of the Most High, and I am pleasing to God. I am qualified by the Father. I am redeemed, righteous, rescued, ransomed, and reconciled. S, I am a saint and the salt of the earth. T, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit, and I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. U, I am under grace and united with Christ. V, I am victorious through Christ and vindicated by God. I am a witness of God's power, a worshiper of Jesus, and washed by the Spirit. I am an ex-enemy of God, I am yoked with Christ, and I am zealous for good works and for the glory of God. That's who I am, and that's who you are in Him. Never forget who you are. Never forget what your identity in Christ is. And and again, Peter gives us some examples of 
um, he, he um, articulates that in a few different ways. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, he says, You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. Again, those two words, you are, a lot could be said after those two words. A lot is said after those two words. This is what God says, who you are. He says, you are a chosen people. Ephesians 1, verse 4 says, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. God chose you before time began. He chose you before, way before Genesis, whenever that may have been. He knew you. He called, he, he chose you to be a member of his family. And then when it, when it came time to carry out and to fulfill everything that would make you who you are, he sent his son into the world. And not just for the world, but for you individually. And when you came into this world as a human being, he sought you out and brought you to faith and brought you into his family. He says, you are a royal priesthood adopted into God's royal heavenly family. You are commissioned then also. As a, the, the, the idea of a priest is someone who, who serves God. I mean, as Christians, we all do, but the, the Old Testament picture, you are commissioned into a lifelong spiritual ministry of honoring God and serving God and loving God. You are, it says, a holy nation, despite believers' differences in race, in nationality, in, in, in gender, in socioeconomic status. None of that matters. Faith in Christ makes each of us members of what we call the Holy Christian Church, all believers of all time, God's family of faith, that will live with him for eternal life in heaven. You are, Peter writes, and this is my favorite one, you are God's special possession. Not possession as in property, that you are owned by him. You are, but more in the way of a family member. Right? You were, you were claimed by God. You were connected to God. And you are cherished by God every second of every single day. That you, Peter goes on to say, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You know, being a disciple of Christ, as, as it's demonstrated here in this one verse, as Jesus demonstrates too in Matthew 5, the reading uh, 13 to 16, being a disciple of Christ and acting as a disciple of Christ are intimately connected, right? It's what one goes with the other. You are all these things. And so what God says is be all these things. You know, what, what, what a thing is, it finds its fulfillment only when it does what it was made to do. So in other words, what good is a treasure if it's buried in the bottom of the ocean? It's not doing anyone any good. What good is a beautiful piece of art if it's locked in a vault behind a bunch of other pictures, a bunch of other pieces of, of, of art, um, a canvas over the top, dust all over it to protect it? What, but what good is it doing buried somewhere that no one sees it? What, what good is a skill or a strength that a person has if they never, ever use it? Why? It, it, it's not serving any purpose. And so what good is a Christian then who hides their faith, covers the light of their faith as Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, who, who hides their, 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 the light of their faith under a bowl? The truth is our lives should always reflect who we are. And that's what Jesus says, again, in Matthew 5. You are, the, uh, you are the light of the world. You are salt of the earth. You are salt. In other words, you have value, first of all, and you also have purpose. In Jesus' day, practically speaking, salt was a preservative in lieu of refrigeration, right? Um, spiritually speaking, as Christians, we are meant to be preservatives. Preservatives of the truths of God's word here on this earth and preservatives of, of Christian values and morals. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are light. Light is powerful, right? Light is influential. Light scatters darkness. Your words are powerful, both to build up and to tear down. Your actions are influential, both can be both positively and negatively. Your Christ-reflecting life scatters the darkness of, of fear and hate and, and doubt and guilt. You know, I, 
um, I don't think many people would disagree with me. If any, I mean, you know, when you're in, in an airplane, you're flying over um, at a, a city at night, just the city lights. It, it's just a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to see city lights, uh, whether it's from an airplane or another high vantage point. Um, strikingly beautiful, isn't it? And that's what God, Jesus, is saying to us here. Be that to others. You are a child of God. So be strikingly beautiful. Be strikingly beautiful in, in the midst of a troubled and cruel, quite honestly, and dying world. The big question then is, what does that look like? How can we be powerful, influential, darkness-scattering light in the world that we live in today? A few ideas, a few suggestions. In a world that seems to think that the way to feel better is by holding onto a grudge, by being angry, or maybe even retaliating, be a forgiving person. One who doesn't hang on, but who lets go. In, in a world that seems to think that canceling others is the way to happiness or to be happier, some sort of fulfillment, be someone who, who forgives. Uh, love your neighbors as yourself. Even those with whom you don't disagree, even those with whom you strongly disagree. You know, in, in a world that seems to think that the ends justify the means, be a person of integrity. That's what it means to be salt and light. In, in a world that seems to think that, that opinions can and maybe even should be angrily expressed, speak the truth in love. Including and especially to, to, to folks with whom you are not in agreement. In a world in which selfishness and self-indulgence seem to be virtues, be patient and be kind and be generous, be gracious to others. In a world that more and more seems to think that freedom is found apart from Christ, let others see and, and hear about the freedom that you have found in Christ. Freedom from the guilt of your sin, freedom from shame, freedom from the, the oppressive weight of sin and its eternal consequences, and then therefore free to follow and obey God. Not because, again, you have to, that would be the law. No, we are free to follow our Savior Jesus because of who he is and what he has done for us and who he has made us to be. Now, why would we want to do that? To Bump up the approval rating of Christians, that wouldn't be a bad thing, but that's not the point. The point ultimately is, as Jesus says here, to let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and not see you though, but see in you, see what is in you, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That's what it's all about. Yeah, these days perhaps the, the, the trends are going in the wrong directions, uh, in the wrong direction. That's okay. Jesus said it would be this way. I'm not saying we have to love it or embrace it. We're certainly not going to feel sorry for ourselves. And, and think of it this way, though, too. What an opportunity we have. What a beautiful privilege we have. We are salt. We are light. You are a child of God. You are, we are on the front line of the great commission that Jesus gave us. And you heard that earlier during the baptism. Go and make disciples of all nations. We are on the front lines of that, especially in a city like L.A. What a privilege, that, what an opportunity it is. The Lord has made you his child. You are a child of God. So be that child of God. So that others may see God, that they may see Christ in you. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for bringing us out of, out of the darkness of unbelief and into the light of faith. You are a gracious God. You are a merciful God. You are a perfect and holy God, and we aren't. And so the fact that you've done that for us is just absolutely mind-boggling. Um, and so we just, we just say thank you, and we enjoy it, and, and we, we take that peace that you have given us, a peace that is found in no other place, and we cherish that. We cherish the relationship we have with you. We cherish our identity, which is child of God, children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, heirs of eternal life in heaven. Thank you. Thank you for... for making us all of that and for giving us the privilege to, 
to be lights in this world and to be salt. Give us courage. Give us wisdom. Uh, give us patience as we live in a sinful world. And when we, when we fall into the very same sins, lead us to understand and to see our fall, to understand it, to, to humbly repent and then be lifted back up by your amazing grace and the forgiveness that only you can give. Help us then to live out that grace and that peace, to be lights and salt in this world. So that others, again, may see our, God, our good deeds, but not see us, but see you. See the one who has made us like this. See the one who has promises for us that go into eternal life with you in heaven. Lord, we also pray this morning a prayer of thanks for 80 years of life that you gave, have given here to, to Jane Bruckner. Yesterday was her 80th birthday. Thank you for the many, many blessings that you've given to Jane, husband, children, family, friends, experiences, opportunities, uh, opportunities to serve you and to, to serve others and to be a blessing to others. Thank you for blessing this church family uh, with Jane and her, her spirit, her friendship, her, her, uh, her service, her leadership. Thank you for the many ways that you blessed her and blessed others through Jane. And we ask that, Lord, you, you uh, keep her in the palm of your hand as you promised to do until one day you gather her and all believers in Christ into eternal life with you in heaven. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.